Hi everybody. Welcome to chapter 10. Let's start with Mitch's point of view. Mitch. I drove, shivered, and drove. Turned the heater up to high and drove. No Parkers, no Jared, no family, no dojo, probably no job. Only one place left to go. Only one safe place. I was out on the open road doing 90 before I slowed down to the speed limit. My arm had gone from a sharp ache to a sharp pain to a sharp howl. I clutched it tight to my chest, hoping it would ease the pain. But every bounce in my ugly truck made my arm scream again. Each time I touched my face, it felt bigger and ached more. The cut on my cheek never stopped oozing. I drove. No matter how high I turned the heater, I shivered. And I drove. Then the rain finally stopped, but I kept driving. Homeless, alone, hurt. I could barely see the road as tears welled up in my one good eye. God, it wasn't supposed to be like this. Jared. Officer Lopez returned to the car, took a seat beside me, and pulled out a small notebook. We sent a car to check the number you gave, a quickie mart only a few minutes from here. They found the payphone with blood on it. We think it's his, but no ugly truck. Officer Lopez asked me several questions. I answered. A few minutes later, the other officers marched Bailey to another squad car protected his head, and had him sit in the back. Did you smell that? One of the officers said to the others as he closed the door on the other police car. Do you think Lassiter? Sure wasn't the kid. He's nowhere around. He wasn't wearing pants anyway. That makes this case a little weirder. Not weirder. It makes Lassiter a little more pathetic. They walked off. Officer Lopez, I asked, closing the journal. The rain had stopped. The crowd had started to disperse. Why was Mitch almost naked? Working theory, Officer Lopez said. Mitch was getting ready for a thigh shot when Bailey attacked. Mitch fled. We found Mitch's pen in the fire, all prepped and ready to go, and melted. The kid never got a chance to use it. What will happen if Mitch doesn't get his insulin, I asked. Officer Lopez made a few notes, then took the journal and thumbed through it. Every diabetic is different. Too many factors to take into account. Some are more sensitive, some make a little on their own. I would guess that Mitch is one of the more sensitive ones, and with as fast as his body reacts, he doesn't handle carbs very well. He could get sick, his glucose could, just, could skyrocket even higher. Only a doctor can say. It's bad then. Handing the journal back, Lopez said, if he stays that high too long, let's say a day or two, he could go into a coma. We have informed the hospital of his condition, and they're ready just in case. If he reaches 400, he needs an emergency room. Let me give you my cell. Mitch calls you, you call me. Could he die? Officer Lopez sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. Any time, day or night, call me. I felt as if Bailey had hit me. I only thought Minch was being overly paranoid. Who knew that diabetes could be life-threatening? Once Mitch was safe, I needed to learn about his condition. Two more police cars arrived. Officer Lopez asked me more questions about where Mitch could go, where he worked. The police questioned everyone, checked with the hospital and Instacare, the Harding Health Food, and even Sensei Robert at the tournament. They didn't find Mitch or the ugly truck. My phone rang. Mitch, I shouted. Where are you? Not Mitch, his Sensei. The police are here asking you about Mitch. What's going on? I told him. What do you need from me? Robert said. Call me if you hear from him, I said. Then I called Harding's Health Food and spoke with Mrs. Harding. 
I found out Mitch was supposed to be to work tomorrow morning. I don't think he's going to make it, I said. Is it that bad? When I find him, I'm taking him to the emergency room. Call me if you hear anything. The crime scene processor showed up photographing everything, even the final page in the journal. Bailey was taken away in one of the police cars. He would have done the same, he boasted to the police. I went to the all-night diner that Mitch sometimes slept at, had my phone out, and waited. No call came. I imagined a pale, almost naked, dead body inside an ugly truck pulled off of the road somewhere. Or maybe Mitch in some car accident, his pale body crushed beneath his ugly truck. Or Mitch had fallen into a coma and had nobody there to help him. Or maybe he had just given up. No, I wouldn't think like that. Mitch was too strong, too independent. Not like me. Mitch, no, it wasn't supposed to be like this. I hugged my arm to my chest. Broken? God, I hoped not. Midnight at the overlook look at Dead Man's Butte was dark, and I was alone except for a slim crescent moon to the west and the million stars above. The butte was only a shadow straight ahead. The cold and wet seeped through the thin fabrics of my briefs from the metal bench I sat on. Itching a little, the athletic cup underneath the briefs jabbed into the skin around my groin. The karate bottoms, who knew what had happened to them? My left cheek oozed from the cut the ring had left. My left eye was swollen shut. The cuts on my palms and soles of my feet from the glass shards had stopped bleeding but it felt like I had glass in some of them. My sleeveless Megadeth t-shirt didn't survive tonight. It had a six inch tear along my stomach and I couldn't remember what I had snagged it on. No mala beads, only the metal alert bracelet. I won't be winning any fashion shows tonight. No wallet either, no phone, some gas, no shoes, freezing. The headache ripped up from my neck through my entire head. My hair, wet and stringy, had slipped free of the tie, and I pulled the tie out with a shaking hand. Snap. My last tie broke and flew onto the gravel somewhere. Jared knew. That look on his face. The horror. He hated me, just like Bailey had said. The screaming music of suicide queens assaulted the air from my tinny speakers of my old truck. My hands wouldn't stop shaking. My blood sugar soared, and with no insulin to bring my glucose under control, it would just keep going up until sometime in the next few days I'd fall into a coma. God, how could tonight go so wrong? I couldn't think. I grabbed the glucose meter. Turn on, turn on, please turn on. I rocked it back and forth, shook it, banged on it. It wouldn't turn on. I had checked it fifteen damn times and it wouldn't work. How long could I survive without it, without my insulin? I chucked it as hard as I could, hearing it hit the gravel somewhere. No, I sobbed. Lancet. What happened to the lancet? No lancet. No prick. No blood. It didn't matter. No journal to track my results. My soul fell into my stomach and my chest ached, and my arm, and my face. Ribs, hands, feet. God, everything hurt. My brand new test strips were either soaked or scattered among all the glass shards back at the monster house. I could never check now. Never survive. Where's the insulin pen? Where's the needles? What was I supposed to do? No insulin. How soon until I had nerve damage or went blind or even die? I should have spat the cake out. Now I would spike higher than I ever had. No way to tell. I already felt tired and I couldn't think. My neck muscles tightened. The headache that I thought was huge before became a nuclear explosion. Stress. Panic. The migraine again. Spiking. No meter. No insulin. No Jared. My eyes teared. Nothing. I could do.
Jared could help, but Jared knew the truth. No help there. No help anywhere. The blood from my cheek oozed down my chin and onto the vest with the 100 pins and patches right onto the patch for 13 hells. I had no idea where that CD was. I held up the last pawn to the dragon chest set, the only one that survived. Hand carved, painted white, it was a little sleeping dragon with a tiny sapphire eye just peeking open. Pawns can be anything they want. Another lie. Pawns never survived. I threw it on the ground and watched it bounce into the shadows, the little eye falling out. A single pawn is useless, just like me. I pried myself off the metal bench, so tired, walked back to my truck and pulled out the blanket I used to lay on to change oil. At least I could be warm while I was miserable. I went back to the bench and stared at the sky. The clouds cleared, the stars came out, and I saw the faint streak of a meteor, the Perseid shower. Me and Jared used to play the game of count the meteors. Jared would stare east, I would look west, and we would call out how many we saw in five minutes. Sometimes we would try to see one with the G-Skyer. We never did, but half the fun was just being with Jared no matter what we did. Jared had a way of making anything fun, even cleaning up the backyard. But the look on Jared's face tonight, was it fear? Horror? Bailey was right. People hated me. The hat worked perfectly. As soon as Jared saw it, he knew, as did all the other people watching. If my life was bad before, at least I kind of had people to turn to. Now it was worse. No Jared, which meant no Mrs. Parker. I wanted to run away. There was no way the ugly truck could make it to California. Not with its mileage. Did I have enough gas for Vegas? Sure, but much further and I would run out of gas. Another meteor streaked through the sky, longer than the first, and a little brighter. I pulled my legs in close and wrapped the blanket around them. I had no choice but to go back to the butte. Maybe the Hardings would let me work behind a counter somewhere until I could afford pants. Except Hardings Health Food didn't have any counters like that. I could beg off the side of the Catholic parish, make a little sign from scrap cardboard, and tell the police took me in for indecent exposure. Jared would have laughed at that and called me a pervert, and I would say, that's why you love me. Everything was different now. No YouTube happy endings for me. I laid down on the bench, wrapping the blankets around as much, as much of me as I could. Another meteor perfect night for it. I tried to sleep, but the throb in my arm kept me up. The ache in my face whenever I moved my mouth made my eyes water. At least that's what I told myself. Why wouldn't my cheek stop dripping? Jared. 6 a.m. at the diner, my fourth cup of mediocre coffee, and still no one had called. It was going on ten hours, and I had not found Mitch. With each passing hour, I imagined another disaster. My latest? The ugly truck died on some road and Mitch was hit by a semi as he flagged down help. Mitch was an adult, right? Always independent. Always calm. Emotionless, right? Not after last night. I endured the fear I felt and held my breath. Every time I closed my eyes, I imagined Mitch dead somewhere. I wouldn't allow that. I'd make the rounds again, Instacares, the hospital, the dojo, my home, the monster house. Maybe the ugly truck broke down somewhere and Mitch needed a ride. Please God, let him be okay. I had played and replayed the video fifty times, and each time something inside me broke. My phone rang. It must be Mitch. I could scream at him for the torture, and I picked it up, yelling, Mitch, where are you? Not Mitch, Michaela said. I guess you haven't found him then? 
No one has. Sorry we were gone. Took a little trip to the hot springs in Moapa, and we were, um, incommunicado. We are on the road, and we will be back in a couple of hours. Did he try calling you, I asked. Nope. Josh's phone is a no-show either, Michaela said. I've tried calling. Mitch this morning, but nothing. I took a long sip of coffee. His dad broke his phone. Can you think of any place he might have gone? Tell me where you've looked, Michaela said. I listed all the places that he or the police had been. I think you know where he's at. We both do. It's where he goes to think. Or die, I thought. My hands chilled. An isolated spot in the middle of nowhere. Perfect if you didn't want anyone to bother you. The overlook at Dead Man's Butte. It's an hour round trip. His arm has to be busted. Could he even make it? I don't know. Maybe he only made it halfway. New image. May Mitch's pale corpse out in the place he loved so much. That one was the most logical of all my fears. Maybe that's why it hurt. You okay? Michaela said. You went quiet. We were going out there tonight, I said. But I'll head out right now. He'll be okay. Don't panic, or you'll be like Mitch when he misses a test. I managed to save his journal. It's in the car. I paid my bill and drove to the overlook. Every car on the side of the road looked like the ugly truck. Anybody wearing black looked like Mitch. As I grew closer to the overlook, I pictured Mitch in the ugly truck. His corpse sprawled in the driver's seat. Maybe I should call Officer Lopez and let him check. Finding Mitch's body would drive me over the edge. I didn't want to look. Not if that's what I would find. Maybe Mitch ran out of gas somewhere. The overlook is pretty far from any station, and cell service is spotty at best. Except Mitch's phone is as broken as his arm. I pulled off the highway and into the overlook. No ugly truck. No Mitch. I drove around a minute and then slowed to a stop. Mitch can't be dead. If I keep telling myself that, maybe I'll believe it. I parked and climbed out to stretch my legs. The butte towered in the distance. Short plants and cactuses and puddles of rain were around. A minor weight lifted from my shoulders. No ugly truck. No dead body. Here at least. I walked around a little and wandered over to the spot Mitch had always set up the g skyer In the day, it was perfect for looking at the butte or at the desert. At night, the heavens were a work of art. Mitch had shown me Jupiter once, with the tiny dots that were its moons. A running joke? Who else had shown me the stars, and the planets, and the moon? For me, it had been a joke. But for Mitch, it might have meant something else entirely. Then I realized something that made me smile. Mitch hadn't stopped dating. He'd been dating me, and I never knew it. The sneaky bastard. My smile faded as I saw a small rectangle glinting in the morning sun. I walked over and picked it up. Mitch's meter. He had been here. A little speck of white was nearby, but it was missing the eye. One of the chess pieces Mitch loved and kept at the back of his closet. I picked it up as well. That meant he was alive. No dead guy would drive that chuck. No living guy would either, except Mitch. Either Mitch had headed back early, or had passed me without realizing. I pulled out my phone to call Officer Lopez. No reception. I ran for my Hyundai, started it, and sped back to town. Fifteen minutes later, I had two bars, and I called Mom. Have you heard from Mitch? Nope. And Officer Lopez called, and Mitch's sensei. Nobody's heard anything. He was at the Overlook last night. I don't know where he is now. I'll stay by the phone, Mom said. Then I called Michaela and told her. Nobody knew where Mitch would go next. I took a guess and headed for the dojo. Sending mornings was unscheduled workout time. Anybody could come in and practice, use the weights or punching bags, practice in front of the mirrors, or use the showers and get cleaned up. Mitch usually went in and stayed a couple of hours when he didn't have to go to Harding's. I drove over, 
forcing myself not to imagine Mitch passed out somewhere, and found the ugly truck parked across three parking spaces, door left open, idling. The weight and worry and fear plaguing me vanished. Instead, it was replaced by an intense hatred. I found Mitch. I wanted to kill Bailey. The good news was the right side of Mitch's face looked normal. If you ignored the dirt and blood and the little cuts, the left side did not. The left side of his face was swollen and his left eye swollen almost shut. His cheek trickled blood from a nasty looking cut. That one would need stitches. A bruise the size of a basketball was on his arm. Both hands had dried blood streaks on them and little cuts. His hair was a tangled mess and it sparkled. Mitch didn't walk. He stumbled in a forward direction, holding his old oil blanket around him. His shirt was ripped, hanging on him more than fitting him. Through the rip, a huge purple bruise glared out. Mitch had the pride hat pulled backwards, trying to keep the hair in place, but it didn't work. He looked worse than the corpse I had imagined. That monster had done this to him. Something like this was way beyond what I could cope with. I called Officer Lopez as Mitch opened the door to the dojo.